Hello there. Um, good evening and welcome once again, dear friends, family, all the members of International House of His Presence, um, all over the place. Um, this is Church in the Cloud, and uh, as we have this online service, I trust God that we'll have a refreshing time in the presence of the Lord. Like we started in some of our social media handles, like Facebook, um, we started to deal with issues um, this week. Um, this marks a very pivotal week concerning the things Jesus Christ did in the course of his earthly ministry. And this week in the body of Christ, in the global church, uh, represents in history the last week or the last few days of um, Jesus um of Jesus' earthly ministry, the things he did amongst us. And you see, it's very important as Christians that we don't just car get carried away by what is happening around us, which sometimes can become distractions. We, this is a time to internalize, to look inwards, to look to the Lord, and search our hearts and search his word to know the priceless things Jesus did for us, especially as we recognize this pivotal week of his earthly sojourn. So today, I want to deal with something that is very important concerning every Christian and also everyone who is interested in following Jesus and also every curious person out there. Um, to, I start something today and I trust God that as we um, recognize what we call Good Friday, the day Jesus was, that's, uh, that, that marks the day Jesus was crucified, we'll take this subject I start today, we'll take it further on Friday. And so today, I want to deal with what I call blood power. Blood power. Because, you see, uh, um, Paul, I mean, Dr. Luke wrote in the Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Luke, he wrote to his disciple, his son in the faith, um, Theophilus, and he wrote amongst other things in Luke chapter 1. I'd like to read verse 1 and verse 4, but it may be good for you after now to read from verse 1 to verse 4. He said, for as much as many have taken, I'm reading from the King James Version. He said, for as much as many have taken in hand to set forth in order a declaration of those things which are most surely believed amongst us. I believe like never before in the times in which we live, in the situations that we're surrounded with in these times as um, Christians, we need to receive a declaration. We need to receive a comprehension of the things that are most surely believed amongst us. And then he went on to say in verse 4, that thou mightest know the certainty of those things wherein thou hast been instructed. So I believe there are many things Jesus did for us, but especially in this last week when he went all the way to Calvary and was, I mean, hung on the cross, um, for every one of us, we need to know the certainty of the things we believed so that also we may know the certainty of those things wherein we have been instructed. And so today I'd like to bring to attention the importance of the blood of Jesus in the life of the believer. Every Christian must recognize, must comprehend, must internalize, and must be able to weld as a weapon the mighty power that is in the blood of Jesus Christ. And I'd like to start today, I, I, want us, I want to look into five things the blood of Jesus does for us. But uh, I'm, I'm not too sure I'll be able to deal with those five things today, So, but we'll try to deal with about two or three of them today. And so you see, the blood of Jesus that he shed on Calvary's cross uh, for every one of us offers to every Christian and everyone who comes to God by Jesus Christ offers several potent things for us. And amongst other things, I'd like us to recognize that the blood is offers us what I call the new covenant. The new covenant. By covenant, covenant simply means an agreement or a testament, a basis of a relationship. It could be a marriage relationship. It could be a business relationship. It could be a, a, a friendship, whatever the form of the relationship. Covenant is like a terms of agreement or a testament that gives basis to the relationship. And you see, before Jesus came, there have been different types of covenants amongst other other covenant um, amongst other things. There was the covenant he, um, God made with Abraham that brought about circumcision. 
where men present the foreskin of their bodies and it, then it's caught, the foreskin of their bodies is caught and blood is shed. But that was a mark that God gave to Abraham and through Abraham to his seeds, to the members of his household, as a means of a reminder of the covenants God has struck with Abraham and the terms of that covenant. And then you see, after the time of Abraham, God also uh, entered into a covenant with the nation of Israel. And that covenant was ratified also by blood. You see, as Moses was sharing the terms of the covenant with the people, and the people accepted the terms of the covenant, he brought blood and took his up and sprinkled the blood all over the most holy place of the sanctuary. So also ratifying the covenant God had with the nation of Israel, according to the Old Testament pattern. But you see, those covenants were not potent enough. That is why you see from generation to generation, from time to time, every high priest has to offer sacrifices by the blood of lambs or bulls or, or, or of uh, um, goats for himself and also for the nation. So you see, um, Hebrews captures this very sufficiently. Hebrews chapter 7, I'd like to read from verse 22 to verse 28. He said, by so much more, Jesus has become a surety of a better covenant. Also, there were many priests because they were presented by, um, prevented by death from continuing, but he, that is Jesus, because he continues forever, has an unchangeable priesthood. Therefore, he's also able to save to the uttermost those who come to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. For such a high priest was fitting for us, who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and has become higher than the heavens, who does not need daily as those high priests to offer sacrifices, first for his own sins, and then for the people's. For this he did once for all, when he offered up himself. For the law appoints as high priest men who have weakness, the weakness of the flesh, the weakness of the Adamic nature. He said, but the word of oath, which came after the law, appoints the Son Jesus, who has been perfected forever. So you see, Jesus, when he offered his blood, he offered the terms of a new covenant and he himself spoke in this breath when you read matthew chapter 26 the new king james translation i'm reading from verse 27 to verse 28 the bible says he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them his disciples those who have received him those who believed in him and gave it to them saying drink ye all of it for this is my blood of the new testament or new covenant which is shed for many for the remission of forgiveness of sins so you see here jesus offered his blood so that men may have a new way he said this is the new covenant or new testament in my blood and paul i mean hebrews ratified this further when you read hebrews chapter 10 from verse 19 he said that from verse 19 to verse 20 he said therefore brethren having boldness to enter in, in the holiest by the blood of jesus by a new and living way which he has consecrated for us through the veil that is his flesh. So you see here, the writer of Hebrews bringing to us understanding that when Jesus shed his blood, I read that again, he said, therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus. The holiest is the most holy place where the living God, the creator of the heavens and the earth can be found, where the throne of God is established. He said, by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which he has consecrated, made holy for us through the veil that is his flesh. So we approach God with boldness. Jesus, amongst other things, by the blood he shed, gave us access to the throne of God, the throne of grace, the throne of glory. Before Jesus shed his blood, no man had the capacity, no man had the power to be able to have access to the throne of God. And that is why when we come to the throne of God, when we come before the throne of God, we come with, sorry, excuse me. When we come before the throne of God, we, we come with boldness, but not the boldness of an attitude, not the boldness of arrogance, not the boldness of, I, I, I'm the one who can come before my father at any time. No, that boldness should be with a sense of assurance of what God has done for us by the blood of his son, Jesus Christ. And should also, we come not just with boldness, which guarantees our assurance, but should also be with reverence, with humility. Remember, we're accessing 
the presence of the Almighty God, the maker of the heavens and the earth, the one who is able to destroy in a moment, the one who is able to create in a moment. So, amongst other things, the first thing I'd like us to understand here is that Jesus gave us a new covenant, a new agreement by which we're able to access the throne of God with assurance, with confidence, and with reverence so that we are able to meet with the maker of the heavens and the earth. But not just that, the blood of Jesus that was shed on Calvary's cross does not just give us a new covenant, a new way of living on the face of the earth. The second thing I'd like us to understand is the blood of Jesus serves as sacrifice for sins. By sacrifice, we mean propice. In the Bible uses the language also propitiation. You read in Romans chapter 3, verse 25. We read in 1 John chapter 2 from verse 1 to verse 2. It talks about my, my children do not sin. He said, but if any man sins, we have an advocate with the father. He's like a lawyer before the father. He said, who has been made a propitiation for us. I'd like to read that also. I mean, 1 John chapter in first john chapter 2 from verse 1 to verse 2 it says in that place sorry excuse me first john chapter 2 from verse 1 to verse 2 my my little children these things i write to you so that you may not sin and if anyone sins we have an advocate with the father jesus christ the righteous verse 2 and he himself is the propitiation or the sacrifice for our sins and not for us only but also for the whole world so i'd like us to understand one second the second thing the blood of jesus does for us is that the blood of jesus serves as sacrifice for sins it also sacrifice means propitiation it also means atonement the whole world has the nature of sin by reason of the original sin of the first man that lived on the face of the earth by reason of Adam and Eve, every human being, irrespective of culture, irrespective of location, irrespective of generation, we have that Adamic nature by reason of our natural birth. And it's a sinful nature. It's a nature that Adam was not created with, but a nature Adam took up when he listened to the devil in the serpent. But you see, from that is why no man can just access God. No man can just come to God. Anyhow, because we take up that Adamic nature, which is a sinful nature. No wonder when you read in Psalm 51 and verse 5, he said, Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity or in wickedness, and in sin my mother conceived me. And the, the psalm was simply bringing to attention here that you don't even need to teach a child to sin. You don't need to teach a child to tell lies. You don't need to teach a child to, to cheat. We don't need to cheat and teach a child to steal. You don't even need to teach a child to be stingy. We don't need to teach a child to have a sense of pride, a sense of arrogance. It's part of the Adamic nature, the fallen nature. And see, with that nature, no man can truly, consistently, and beneficially access or approach the throne of God. And that is why there was a need for a sacrifice. For the sin of man, the sin of the Adamic nature, the sin of our human nature, there was need for a sacrifice. And so you will see, the Bible makes us understand in Romans chapter 3 and verse 23, he said, for all have sinned, no matter who we are, no matter how our looks, no matter our piety, all have sinned and come short, fall short of the glory of God. So you see, Jesus shed his blood as a sacrifice, as an atonement, as a propitiation for all the sins of men. Remember, in that first John chapter 2 and verse 2, it talks about Jesus Christ being made, for, made a propitiation for our sins. And not just our sins, those of us who have received Jesus as Lord, but also for the sins of the whole world. Because the whole world lies under the sway of the wicked one. The whole world was bathed and born with the Adamic nature. So Jesus offered himself not just for this sin, as sacrifice for the sins of the church, but as sacrifice for the sins of the whole world. And that is why I'd like us to understand here, when Jesus came and shed his blood, as a sacrifice, it was to meet the demands of justice. You know, Romans in another place in chapter 6, verse 23 says, 
for the wages of sin, the price, the consequence, the wages of sin is death. He said, but the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus. So, but here we're looking at what the blood offers us, the power in the blood of Jesus as a sacrifice for our sins. You see, anyone who sins, there must be judgments that must come um, with it. There are consequences for sins. Just like when uh, someone uh, has his property stolen and he files the case in court and he goes through the police uh, investigation and then the lawyer is employed both by the prosecutor and even also by the defendants. Eventually they all go to court and the accused will be put in the dock. But you will see the person whose property is stolen will also be in court looking out that the terms of justice is met. That the person who did undeedly against this victim is served justice. So Jesus had to come as sacrifice for the sins of the whole world, for the sins of all human beings, of all generations in every nation, as a sacrifice. And I said here, to understand sacrifice, it is so that the demands of divine justice, the divine, the demands of moral justice is served, is met. Furthermore, I'd like us to understand here, he said the wages of sin is death. And so Jesus had to die, he had to sacrifice his life so that the death all human beings were meant to die was placed upon him. He became our sacrifice in death. He became the one who took the dock in the courtroom of righteous justice on behalf of every human being. He stood in the dock of the guilty. He stood in the dock of the defendant. And here, he offered his life, he offered his precious blood, because in the life of a thing, is in the, the life of a thing is in the blood. The blood of a thing carries the life of it. So you see here, Jesus offered his life as sacrifice for our sins, to meet what I call the legal and moral terms of sin and its consequences. Whosoever sins will die. But here, Jesus paid the wages of sin on our behalf. So by the sacrifice he shed on Calvary's cross, by the blood he shed, he met the legal and moral terms of sin and its consequences. Furthermore, by the blood he shed as a sacrifice, he made sure that justice was served. You know, in this case, the accuser of the brethren, the Bible makes us understand the book of Revelation, is the devil, is Satan, is the adversary, is the one who accuses us. Before the Father, day and night, God is the righteous judge. He's the one sitting on the judgment seat. The accuser is the devil. But the one in the dark, for every human being who has lived on this earth, we are meant to be dogged. We are meant to be served justice. But on our behalf, Jesus entered the dock on behalf of every human being. And he defended our cause. And the penalty was meted out that the wages of sin is death. And he served he met those terms. And so we are saying here, he made sure that justice was served. That was why in the wisdom of God, God had to make sure that the one who accuses us, the accuser of the brethren, was also in the court. He, 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 he was the one who came and used his cohorts and used his demons through the Roman soldiers and through Pilate and through the convocation in hell to make sure that justice was served. God made sure that the one who accused every one of us, he made sure that he was involved in the court process. He made sure he saw the judgment that was served. That, he, that is why, you see, he was involved in crucifying Jesus. In the beatings the Roman soldiers placed upon him. And you read in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, I'd like to read that from verse 6 to verse 8. He says here, however we speak wisdom amongst those who are mature, yet not the wisdom of this age, nor the rulers or the princes of darkness of this age, who are coming to nothing. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery. The mystery is a hidden through truth. Something that was not apparent, but by the revelation of God, we are able to comprehend the depth of what went on. So while Satan was accusing every one of us, and make sure Jesus was put in the dark, and make sure that the wages of sin is death, and make sure that the death was inflicted on Jesus, he says here, he said, but we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, the hidden wisdom, which God ordained before the ages for our glory. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus. He said, but for our glory, which none of the rulers of this age knew. 
the princes of darkness, they did not know that by serving justice on Jesus, by making Jesus to die for our, um, for our sins, by making Jesus who stood in the, dock, in the dock for every human being to be punished, to be beaten, and to be nailed to Calvary's cross, to die by, they did not know that justice was being served. They did not know that all the pain they placed on Jesus, all the beatings they placed on Jesus, the death they brought upon Jesus, they did not know that divine justice and moral justice was being served. So you see here, he said none of the rulers of this war age or the rulers of this world knew. For had they known, they would not, First Corinthians chapter 2 verse 8, they would not have crucified. They would not have crucified the Lord of glory. So Satan, the demons of darkness, the fallen angels, they were all, all involved in serving justice to Jesus, in making sure that he died for the wages of the sin of the whole world he took upon himself. The righteous requirement of divine law was met. Satan and his host did not know that they were working out a divine process. God had already ordained from the foundations of the earth that his son would be the sacrificial lamb for the sins of the whole world from the beginning of the world. No wonder when John the Baptist who came to present Jesus, when he saw Jesus in John chapter 1 verse 29, he said, Behold the Lamb of God, the sacrificial Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. In another place, John catching revelation of the eternal purpose of God. You see Revelation chapter 10 and verse 8, he said, All who dwell on earth will worship in him whose name have not been written in the book of life. That is, they worship the devil. They will worship the, the, the beast. They will worship the Antichrist. He said, whose names have not been written in the book of life of the lamb, the sacrificial lamb slain from the foundation of the world. So I'd like us to understand here, friends, Jesus did an awesome work for every one of us, every Christian, and by extension, every human being when he died for the sins of of the whole world. Are you and praise the Lord? Sorry, excuse me. And so you will see, I want us to understand the details of the sacrifice Jesus subjected himself to intentionally while he was being beaten. Him right from the Garden of Gethsemane, beaten in Pilate's court, and beaten by the Roman soldiers, beaten on Calvary's cross, the spear used against his side. All those things Jesus was subjected to. I want us to see the details of it in prophetic portraits, in scriptural portrait. Isaiah chapter 53, from verse 3 to verse 7. And I read. It says, he is despised and rejected by men. When, when he said a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief and we hid as it were our faces from him he was despised and we did not esteem him we feel oh this this guy see what is happening to him see all the pains that's why i keep telling people i tell my wife many times i say we are the ones who, who crucified jesus we made him to be nailed to the cross not just the people who lived in his day not just the Jews who shouted crucify him, but everyone who comes into this world with the Adamic nature. Everyone who is born into this world. He said we, he was despised and we did not esteem him. But he went through all this, the Bible makes us understand here. He said, surely, verse 4, he has borne, that is carried upon himself, our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet, we esteem him stricken that he's been punished for, um, for what he deserved. He said, we esteem him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgression, um, transgressions. The transgressor of everything, transgression of every thief, of every cheat, of everyone who is filled with pride, of everyone who feels by the works of his, his own hands, he will be able to attain greatness in life. The works of the flesh in various ways, it could be pride, it could be you serving the devil through a secret society, a secret cult, the occult or magic, and serving demonic devices. He said, we has, he said here, the, he was bruised for our iniquities. He said he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. Iniquities talks about wickedness, lawless deeds. And every lawless deed human beings have ever concocted on the face of the earth, Jesus paid the price for it. He said he was bruised, not for his own, but for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. 
and by his stripes the beatings he suffered and from the people but from the roman soldiers he was tried several times with with long whips with hooks metal shrapnels with broken bones on the edges of those stone courts he was beaten for our transgression he said by his stripes we are healed this was written before jesus came but peter referred to this after jesus had come in first peter chapter 2 and he said by his stripes we were healed all we like sheep have gone astray we have turned everyone to his own way we do our own things we run riot in life he said and the lord has laid up on him the iniquity the lawlessness the wickedness of us all he was oppressed and he was afflicted yet he opened out his mouth he was led as a lamb to the slaughter and as a sheep before his shearers is silent so he opened not his mouth i'm saying to us here that we need to recognize the potency in the blood of jesus that by that blood he offered the sacrifice he was beaten black and blue every stripe placed on him was for our sake was for our iniquities was for our transgression was for our lawless deeds was for our rebellious ways was for our ignorance and you see everyone who comes to god who appropriates the blood of jesus must know that the sacrifices for his lawlessness our wickedness our rebellious ways have been offered justice has been served the demands of justice has been served the accuser of the brethren has received what he desired that the soul that sins i seen as lucifer he sinned god cast him down death is not just I mean, dropping this earthly body death really in the sight of god means eternal separation from the life of god the nature of god and the presence of god so lucifer knew that when he sinned he was cast away from the presence of god for eternity and now he says whoever sins must also suffer such consequences so jesus took that as sacrifice on our behalf and served justice the last thing i'd like to deal with today before we pray i've been shared with us jesus christ by the blood he shed paved for us a new way of living by the blood he shed his sacrifice he offered the ultimate sacrifice for sins i see unlike the sacrifice of moses and the high priest that was offered through animals the blood of animals can never eternally wipe away or atone for or offer uh, offers propitiation for the sins of human beings and that is why jesus came and offered himself and offered his precious priceless blood that all who come to god by him may receive eternal sacrifice for our sins and the last thing i'd like to deal with here today is that the blood of jesus offers not just a new way of living a new life in christ not just a, 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 a um, sacrifice for sins justice served before the throne of god before the devil and his courts the blood of jesus also offers forgiveness forgiveness of sins friends this is awesome and you see someone sometimes some of us we carry in our deeds we carry the deeds our wrong deeds our wicked deeds we carry those things all, all the days of our lives but i'd like you to know if you come to god by jesus you are forgiven there are many Christians today who are living under the burden of guilt. Oh, I'm going through this because of that and those things I did as an unbeliever. Oh, I'm going through. No, sir. No, man. The price has been paid. The sacrifice has been offered. You have been forgiven. Do you know what it means to be forgiven? To be forgiven also means, I mean, forgiveness of sins also means remission of sins. It also means to let go of all claim of indebtedness every debt of sin that sin has brought into our lives it, the forgiveness of sins means to let go of all claim to indebtedness forgiveness also means to be granted pardon you know you can imagine you stand before a judge and the judge knows that from all the witnesses from all the evidences this guy must spend life in jail or this person must be sent to the gallows in death and death sentence but the judge uses his authority and determines that look by reason of my office by reason of the, the things before me i use my discretion and i declare this guy even though declaring i mean people have said he's guilty but i declare that he's discharged and he's acquitted so forgiveness means to grant pardon many people have been forgiven but they don't know 
Many people have been forgiven, but they are yet to embrace it. They are yet to personalize it. They are yet to comprehend it. To be forgiven is to be granted pardon. To be forgiven is to give up all claim on account of death. I can imagine maybe your house is on mortgage. You have not paid the mortgage, and then the bank is coming to repossess, or the person who loaned you money is coming to repossess. But then by a divine operation, the person comes, and instead of repossessing the land and the, the property, he says, okay, your debts are cancelled. I let go of the property. You don't owe me any money anymore. That is what God did when he made Jesus Christ to shed his blood for every one of us. He said, look, you are guilty. You owe me your life. You are indebted to me. He said, but by forgiveness, I give up all claim on account of death. Forgiveness also means to cease to feel resentment against. The Bible says our, uh, our righteousnesses are like filthy rags in the sight of God. It makes us to be unworthy before God. It makes God to have a sense of resentment toward us. But you see, when that blood was shed on Calvary's cross, <laughs> and Jesus carried that priceless, precious blood before the throne of God, and God smelled that blood and saw that blood, he saw no sin in it, he saw it's priceless and worth it to meet the times. All the resentment God could ever feel towards all men in all generations were wiped away by the blood of Jesus. Friends, I'd like you to know that you are forgiven. In case you are carrying a sense of guilt, maybe you committed a sexual act, maybe you committed a, a fraud act, but genuinely you are coming to Jesus. I'd like you to know that he has not just given you a new way of living. He is not just the sacrifice for your sins. I want you to know that you are forgiven. I come as one sent by God to, to, to speak to you today. No matter that sin, it could be evil thoughts. It could be evil devices. It could be an evil lifestyle. But now you have come to Jesus. I want you to know you are forgiven. The power of guilt is broken in your life today. Maybe you have committed abortion. Maybe you have stolen what is not yours. But you have sincerely turned to the Lord, turned to Jesus. You are forgiven, friends. That weight, that heaviness of sin, of the guilt of sin, it's taken off your shoulders. The yoke is destroyed from off your neck. I declare that by the blood of Jesus and the power contained in the blood, you are forgiving their friends. Friends, whatever the nature, as I close, I'd like you to understand today, whatever the nature, magnitude, or duration of sins in your life, duration of sins in your family, the duration, the magnitude, the potency of sins in your lineage, or in your nation, once you as an individual, you turn to the Lord Jesus. You accept Jesus into your life as your personal Savior. And Lord, the power of sin and the resentment sin generates before God is broken. I declare over someone who has embraced Jesus today, maybe you have embraced Jesus 10 years ago, or you are still carrying the guilt of sin, I declare that you are forgiven. I speak as an oracle of God, and I speak over you. You are forgiving. Paul was a murderer of Christians. He attacked Christians. He persecuted Christians. But when he came to Jesus on the way to Damascus, he was forgiven. Mary Magdalene was possessed of seven demons. The Bible makes us understand she was possessed of demons. But to show the magnitude of her forgiveness, she was even the first, not the apostles, not the other and closer disciples, but Mary Magdalene was the first disciple to see the resurrected Christ. To show that once you are forgiven, it does not matter the background you are coming from. It does not matter the weight of sin, the duration of sin. It does not matter the darkness of your background. Jesus does not, is not prejudiced. Jesus leverages on the power in his blood to forgive all men, irrespective of the potency or the background of the sin. So Jesus' provision here, friends, I like us to understand. You see, the Ethiopian eunuch was rich, was wealthy, was affluent, but he needed forgiveness. You find that in Acts of the Apostles and chapter 8. I like us to understand, friend, one thing the blood of Jesus offers every one of us is forgiveness. I'd like to read some scriptures before I pray here today. He said in Jesus speaking himself, Matthew chapter 26, he said, and as they were eating, Jesus, from verse 26, Jesus took bread and blessed and broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, take it, this is my body. Then he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them saying, drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many, for the remission for the forgiveness, for the atonement 
of sins. And Paul also dealt with this further. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 7. He said in him we have redemption through his blood. We have forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. Friends, don't just confess that you're a carrier of grace. I'd like you to know you are forgiven. No matter the sin, no matter the magnitude, no matter the duration, even from an occultic family, even your father maybe was a weak doctor, you have accepted Jesus, you are forgiven. One more scripture here, Colossians chapter 1 from verse 12 to verse 14, and then we'll pray. Giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in the light. He has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of the Son of His love in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. Oh, what a merciful God. What an awesome God. Friends, I speak over your life, you have a new way of living. I speak over your life, your, your sins have been sacrificed for eternally. You don't need to sacrifice anything anymore. Don't see your tithe as your sacrifice. Don't see your financial gifts as your sacrifice. Don't see the gifts you give to church as sacrifice. Don't let anything replace the blood of Jesus in your life. The ultimate sacrifice accepted in the sight of God is the blood of Jesus. And that blood has been shed for you. And by that same blood, you are forgiven. I'd like us to pray today. I'd like you to pray for yourself. That God will grant you a comprehension of the potency in this blood that was shed by Jesus on Calvary's cross. I'd like you to also pray for yourself that God will make this same blood efficacious in your life. To chart a new way of living for you. A new lifestyle of holiness for you before the throne of God. It's a, a consciousness of sacrifice for your sins that have been paid for. And also to eternally carry the comprehension that you have been forgiven and you live a life that is worthy of the blood that has been shed on Calvary's cross. I speak over your life, you are forgiven as you come to Jesus. I speak over your life, the wages of sin is death, but the wages of sin have been paid for. The righteous requirement of God has been met. The demands of justice of the accused of the brethren have been met. By the blood of Jesus, you are free, friends. There is power in that blood. I'd like you to confess that blood over your life tonight. I'd like you to confess that blood over your family, wherever you are. Confess that blood to speak. That blood speaks better things than the blood of Abel. It speaks mercy. It speaks deliverance. It speaks forgiveness. It speaks sacrifice. Accepted before the throne of God and used to smash the works of the devil. You are liberated. It's a new day. Friends, I'd like to use this.